Well, hey guys, welcome back to Pop Culture Quorum Deo. I'm one of your hosts, Jeff. I'm here with Jared Moore, and we're doing something a little bit different this week, Jared. We're talking about March Madness. Yeah. Well, actually, we're talking more about sports Mm -hmm. and then making particular application to March Madness. Uh, We're doing that because sports is one of the most central aspects of pop culture. Yet it's neglected. Very little people, excuse me, very little analysis from a Christian perspective on how Christians appropriately participate in sports or view it as spectators and Oftentimes, it is when you think of pop culture, it's art, music, movies, television, and sports is often not included in that because it lacks story. Oftentimes, it lacks the narrative, you know, and so people don't know how to approach it lots of time. Well, don't get too far ahead of me there, buddy. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Um, so what you may not know, listener, is that Jared is in the process of writing uh, two books that are dealing with pop culture, one of which I've gotten a chance to see an early chapter on dealing with sports. And I I said this to him off air, and I would say this if you weren't in the room or never heard this. It's the best thing I've ever read as a Christian on sports. And so I'm very Mm -hmm. thankful for his perspective. Thankful I got a chance to learn from him through reading that chapter. I'm hoping that this will be similarly profitable to you as an episode. And then that when that book comes out, you'll all get it and read it and be shaped by it. So it's you and Ted Turnow. Ted Turnow and uh, Stephen Burnett. Yeah. And uh, me and Ted were the primary ones who wrote on sports. And we've got a chapter on. Uh, fantasy that Stephen kind of tackled, and and uh, we've all got different different thing, different strengths, I guess, different areas of pop culture that we love. When you say fantasy, we're not talking about Lord of the Rings. We're talking about fantasy football. No, no, no. I'm talking about um, fantasy as a genre. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, so Lord great. of the Rings. Yeah. Well, this is inside baseball, but I'm just going to let our listeners sit in on it. The other aspect of pop culture that I feel like is most like sports, in that everybody's doing it, but nobody's talking about it as a Christian, is politics. Hmm. Politics has become our great national reality TV show. Oh, wow. Yeah. Have y'all written on that or thinking about writing we on that? We haven't, but I'll, I may argue, encourage the guys um, to think through that politics as a genre, um, which would be very interesting if because you couldn't get more diverse views in politics than us three guys. So that, that would be very interesting to see where we line up. Um, and three very, I mean, we're all confessional Christians, two of us confessional Baptists and one confessional Presbyterian. And um, I've got a almost, well, I'm not done yet. I've almost got a doctor in systematic theology from Southern, and Ted's got one from in apologetics from Westminster. And uh, Stephen is a journalist, um, but he, he's very bright as well on, on his subject matter. It's, uh, Those sound like three good perspectives there. Yeah. Here's the thing. The church needs it because politics is really important, but not ultimate. Yet we live in a world where, because we're increasingly secular, something is going to feel the importance that we would normally have filled with theology. Oh, good call. Yeah. And politics is perpetually pushed up in to that space. It is. And Christians need somebody to come along and say, this stuff's important, but it's not ultimate. Yeah. And really, I think on both sides of our bifurcated political world here, um, Christians are far too identified with their political perspective uh, in a way that does injustice to their identification with the kingdom. Mm. So yeah, you guys are on that. But that's neither here nor there. Right now, we're talking about the world of sports. <laughs> so Jared, you know, normally we walk through these character analysis issues, excuse me, we walk through these worldview analysis issues and then we get into the questions from Ted Turno, is how Mm -hmm. you're saying. Um, Could we talk for a minute about conscience issues that sports raises for us? Um, Yeah, I think, uh, you know, dangers would be the idolatry that can often come with sports. Like, uh, I imagine, did you have a uh, Michael Jordan sleeping bag growing up? I don't know if I had a sleeping bag, but that may be the only thing I didn't (laughs) have. I would never ever, ever eat Wheaties had it not been for Michael Jordan being on their box. Oh, they were awful. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to think of all the things that Michael Jordan pushed me to do as a consumer. Yeah. I mean, I, this shoes. is like, yeah, this is an old cliche, but I once spent $165 on a pair of tennis shoes when my foot was still growing. Yeah. Uh, it, it's insanity. So yeah, absolutely. Idolatry. Idolatry is the big danger. Um, and often they can be larger than life, kind of kind of gods in their own call to see them, right? Um, millionaires, they're praised by millions of people. And, you know, th- this is evident often by like UT football, right? We're both UT fans. You're probably more of a UT fan than I am. Um, but there is something strange and peculiar. Let me just specify. Mm-hmm. We're actually talking about the real UT, which is the University of Tennessee. Oh, yeah. yeah I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, that University of Texas pretender stuff. Yeah. You just get that on out of here. That is true. So, yes. anyway. so you think of like, there's something strange about unity to that team that just because they've got that something about that orange when they put that orange jersey 
on. And um, it, it is really religious in a way. Oh, it's a lot like federal headship. <laughs> I, I'm saying that just as, I mean, it's funny, yeah. but that's one of the places our culture still knows something about federal headship. Good call, yeah. My fortunes are determined by, at one point, Peyton Manning's completion rate or whether or not he beat Florida. Yeah. My federal head affected my experience of life. Wait a second. You've never, you've never played UT football on UT? No, no. I turned them down. <laughs> You know, I, I just had so many options, you know, that that four eight speed I had as a five ten white boy. Four eight? Yeah. Dude, you can't run no four eight on your okay. best athletic maybe, day. M- maybe it was five eight. Five eight sounds. It right. may have been six eight. I can't remember. Those those details are unimportant. Those three hundred pound offensive linemen were faster than us on our best day. That's the truth. Yeah, I get it. I mean that's absolutely right. I mean, the they, first time I ever went to an NFL game, I knew they were big, but to see these monsters <laughs> move like ballerina. Arenas. That's right. I just realized, like, I don't believe in evolution, but these people may be a different species than me. <laughs> And that, you know, that, that went across any ethnic lines. Oh, yeah. That it, there's just, you know, there's just a different category of human in terms of physicality that I don't, I don't have access to. I read to. A, just, uh, just interesting sports fact that Deion Sanders ran a 4-6-40 backwards. Sure. Like he could sure. run it backwards 4-6. Four, four, yeah. That's, that's so encouraging. <laughs> that's so encouraging. He could run faster backwards than I could frontwards. He can run faster backwards than I could probably get on a four-wheeler and catch up to him. <laughs> that's exactly. Exactly. So this is off field. Um, <laughs> idolatry. When at all cost. Um, you know, there's a saying that has become popular in football and the announcers say it all the time. If you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. I hear that all the time. And it and it's it, it is said like that's reality. That's Looking reality at you, football. Patriots fans. Yeah, for real. And that that it's and oftentimes they are talking about the Patriots when when they're they're making those statements. You know, the 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 scandals in all sports concerning performance enhancing drugs reveals the temptation. Dude, I saw did you see that in the Winter Olympics the Russian gold winners in curling lost their medals because of doping? Oh you know cur- curling. Oh yeah, uh, ice sweeping. Yeah, ice sweeping. They're doing- Which by the way, <laughs> I I was you know curling became a thing the last Winter Olympics yeah. I was totally caught up in it I oh, was yeah. much more interested in that than I thought I'd be that's horrifying to think that you ha- I mean the reason why I like part of what I like curling is the USA dude looks, looks like, like you, you and me <laughs> <laughs> looks like you and me he doesn't have, he's not this guy with an a, a eight pack. oh he's got a keg he ain't got an eight pack I <laughs> was always suspicious that you were doping Jared <laughs> yeah I, I, look at me yeah you you look to me like someone who may be performance enhancing yeah right but oh, no you, that that's a great point. And I'm, you know, I don't want to get too far ahead, but I'm also going to say that that speaks to what it means to be human. We are finite as creatures by design Mm -hmm. and sports tempts us to do what we can to transcend that. And that's a that's not a good thing. So, something else that, that's interesting as far as negative things is um, showboating has become so prevalent in the past, uh, I would say, 20 years, um, maybe 30 years. Um, and, you know, we, we don't want to assume, I don't want to assume the worst of athletes, but we also don't want to give them a pass if they have a me first attitude. I, I don't think there's anything wrong inherently with celebrating, um, but, you know, selfish, arrogant showboating should not be praised. You know, one thing that drives me nuts about the NFL is when former players, players, former wide receivers especially, kind of justified the arrogance of wide receivers on the field. They're, they're just like, it, that's what it takes to be the best, or that's what it takes. Like, you got to have this T.O. mentality. T.O. used to run up and down the sidelines. Terrell Owens. Owens. Terrell Owens. Yeah. Used to run up and down the sidelines yelling, I love me some me. I love me some me. I mean, there, there's, I mean, this this fellow, I mean, he played at UTC, all right? U- University of Tennessee, Chattanooga. So he's a Tennessee boy, right? And, uh, well, not, I mean, not UT, but, you know, UTC is pretty, pretty, that's Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Um, So, so we follow this guy and he is remarkable what he did in the Super Bowl with the Eagles after having ankle surgery. Just, he's an unbelievable athlete, unbelievable specimen. Pretty sure he went to UTC as a linebacker. Oh, wow. Yeah, that makes sense. He's built like a linebacker. Exactly. I mean, he, today, the wide receiver, the prototypical wide receiver is built on guys like T.O. and Randy Moss. Yeah. I mean, it's just, and so, but. 
but they justify this arrogance. And and I'll tell you who I believed ruined sports. Um, oh my! On, on on this issue, big statement. Drum roll, please. Uh, Muhammad Ali. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know he one, probably invented rap as well. Okay. Yeah. Good call. Good call. Yeah. Yeah. One one person responsible for showboating. The emphasis on the me first emphasis, at least in promoting a fighter, promoting your brand, branding. Um, he was the best showman in combat sports history and arguably the greatest boxer of all time. I mean, it blows my mind to go back and watch his boxing and to see him fight like George Foreman. George Foreman with these big lunchbox hands. I mean, you imagine that that thing hitting you. He could hit like a Mack truck. Watching Foreman and him coming out in his 40s and winning the title. And then Ali tires him out and whips him. I mean, it just, Ali was an amazing, amazing strategist. And mm-hmm. and uh, but and so his showboating was strategy. He would get in your head before he fought you. And so the match was over before he got you in the ring in many ways. Um, you know, it's interesting. In the 70s, the Jim Crow era was legally over, 1970s, but experientially it was still going on. And so many schools were still segregated in the United States. There were civil rights battles going on in the courts. You know, many blacks and whites at that time were at great odds with each other. And Ali capitalized on this racism by arguing that Joe Frazier was an Uncle Tom on the white man's side against the blacks. So he basically argued that Frazier hated his own race. And it destroyed Frazier. It did. He, they fought three times and Frazier won the first. Ali won the next two. But Ali's punches did not hurt Frazier as much as his words did did. And uh, this is what Joe Frazier said many li- years later. He said, I hated Ali. God might not like me saying that it, that way, but it's in my heart. I know things would have been different for me if he hadn't been around. I'd have gotten a lot more respect. I'd have had more pre- appreciation for my own kind. 20 years I've been fighting Ali, and I still want to take him apart piece by piece and send him back to Jesus. Now, now later on, Frazier said that he forgave Ali, and he lamented, and Ali lamented how Frazier's reputation was hurt by him. You know, Ali said, I said a lot of things in the heat of the moment that I shouldn't have said. Called him names I shouldn't have called him. I apologize for that. I'm sorry. It was all meant to promote the fight. You know, it's one thing to put on an entertaining show. It's another thing entirely to put on an entertaining show at the expense of another human being, right, to where they're devalued. You know, one can be a showman without dehumanizing one's opponent. See, that's what sports kind of argues. Any a me first mentality, a win first mentality, whatever I have to do. And you see it with combat sports, but you also see it in the NFL, like some of the players that we've seen who stomp on each other. You've seen it in uh, th- this past year. I can't remember the Duke player's name who was tripping everybody. Grayson Allen. Grayson Allen. And I mean, you, you see things like that in sports should be, um, well, it should be called evil. It should be um, most of what Duke basketball does. <laughs> Should be called evil. Did you see their 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 uh, their class next year that they've got coming in? Don't want to talk about it. Incredible. Yeah. What are they? How are they not paying these guys? Oh, I don't know. Jared. <laughs> I'm not sure. It the is. FBI may have something to say about that. <laughs> it's unbelievable. They got at least the top three guys. Yeah. Um, so, but let me let me make sure we're tamped down on this. So we have said that conscience warnings, you're going to see people exalted to the place of an idol. You're going to see trash talking that denigrates human beings justified. Mm-hmm. What other conscience things would trouble a Christian going into a sporting event? Um, sporting events, oftentimes, unfortunately, women are, I believe, are dehumanized in a lot of sporting events. Um, it's meant to kind of titillize males who are watching that. And, um, you know, I, I think that uh, women need to be valued. I, one of the one of the one of the primary things that we see in sports where women are devalued is you think of wrestling, right? Think of wrestling, even wrestling today. Now, wrestling, Jeff and I grew up watching wrestling. I what was, about pro wrestling? Pro WWF, wrestling. WWF, yeah, WWE we're, we're talking about fake wrestling. <laughs> I, I grew up with my dad. I was a Hulkamaniac. Hey, you just called it fake, dude. People are going to yeah, come I after know. you. It is choreographed, not fake. I'm sorry. Choreographed. I can't wait till some fake wrestler beats the trash out of you <laughs> next time we're eating dinner. Hey, we know we've got friends who used to be wrestlers, don't we? Yeah. Guys we went to school with. Yeah. Um, but they were about our shape, though. Uh, but but anyway, you, you think of, all right, so when we were growing up, um, women started getting involved more and more in wrestling, but they were they were highly sexualized. So we, we basically stopped watching wrestling. Well, in the past 
few years. Um, they have brought back and made wrestling more family friendly. Um, but the women, the women, the women are actually wrestling now and they're, they're good wrestlers, but they're still in these tea tiny ridiculous outfits. Well, this, you're right. This still may not be the best example though, because yeah. professional wrestling men wear little outfits, wear too. little outfits too. Yeah. Uh, but you're absolutely right that basically when women became a major feature, now there have, you know, the fabulous moolahs and stuff like that in history, mm -hmm. there've always been prominent female wrestlers, but when they became centerpiece attractions, it was only because of physicality. Right. Um, and I, I'm saying that as a consumer, like, I mean, we had bikini contests and strip yeah. offs and stuff like that. And I remember with you, we made a decision. We can watch the WCW rather than the WWF because yeah. it was less so there, yeah. right? The, the, the example of this for me, this is when we were teenagers. Yes. The example for me that really drives this home, that women are treated differently. And I'm going to even take cheerleaders off the table because cheerleaders are the most obvious example of, we just want to parade a body in front of you. Right. Um, but a sport that I love is volleyball. Mm -hmm. There's basketball is number one in my heart. Football is the second thing that I'm, I want to watch most. But third, in terms of playing and watching, I love volleyball. If I'm watching the men play volleyball, they're dressed comparatively to a basketball player. Mm -hmm. If I watch women playing volleyball, they're dressed comparative to a cheerleader. If I watch men play beach volleyball, they're wearing trunks. If I watch women play beach volleyball, which I don't because of this, um, I, they're in bikinis. Mm -hmm. and, and my wife was the first one to highlight this because volleyball basically was something I would watch only when um, the Olympics came around. Yeah, But she would say, you know, I wonder how performance needs from clothing is so different for men in volleyball ball than from women. Yeah. That would lead men to wear bigger clothing and women to wear much, much shorter. I wonder what the performance issue that's driving that is. It's the same in the track and field. Yes, exactly. I mean, it, 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 it's, and I don't know why, I don't, well, I don't know if it's by design, but it's by, I mean, it, it's similar to, I mean, even in society, like leggings, you know, <laughs> I don't see many men in leggings, thank the Lord. We don't need to see women in leggings either, right? You are getting where angel, angels fear to tread, my friend. <laughs> Um, but no, I think we we do need to be very clear that there is quite obviously something about the female form that sports lends itself to displaying in a way that is not respective of who a woman is right. in the total uh, in the totality of her being. Women should not ha be forced to put their sexuality out there on display just to participate in sports. You, you know, I mean that's basically what you and I are saying. We're saying that that uh, men don't have to. For well, the most right, part. and and men sometimes do. So right. we talked about To earlier. Yeah, To was glad to take his shirt off at whatever chance he, sure. he had, right? It's kind of the Matthew McConaughey thing. It, but it was not incumbent upon him right. in the form of the thing that he was doing in the way it appears to be for female athletes. Right. I mean, there, there's a, and listener, you probably know this, there there could be a legitimate women's football league out there, but the one that I'm aware of is a lingerie football league. Right, and you, there's no chance that a national story, like we saw with the lingerie football league, would be created around a boxer's briefs and tank tops league for men. Mm -hmm. it, it would be seen as ludicrous from the jump. Yeah. So, okay, any other conscience issues you see there? No, I think that's it for right now. I, the one that I would add is is that some families are going to be offended in the way that sports uh, insists on determining your schedule. I, I know several people whose family has chosen not to participate in, in sports, and one of those reasons is that, that you know each child has a different game or practice at every part of the night, and so the family is constantly running from one practice to the next game to whatever, and that it has offended Christians who want to create family time. I'm not saying this is right or not. I'm simply saying I know Christians who are offended in the way that sports monopolizes your schedule. So mm -hmm. just something to be aware of. Cool. Um, so we're going to go through creation, fall, redemption, glorification. What's good about sports, Jared? Um, as far as general principles, sports are good in and of themselves. You know, playing is a good thing, a God glorifying thing. Um, I believe that, that it's going to be, it's eternal. I believe that we will enjoy the new heavens and new earth. Um, I believe we'll have games there. I, I believe too. we'll have fun. There may be sports. There may be college teams. There may be. I think there will be sports. I definitely think there will be wins and losses. Yeah. And competition and you'll and you'll say I should have lost right I should have you know. and you'll be rejoicing in the brother who beat you right absolutely and looking right. forward for the chance you have to go again yeah you know 
absolutely. And there'll be no doping, right? And uh, so there'll be a pure sports one day. So we need to celebrate when we see it today, right? We need to celebrate, you know, enjoying sports and its athletes. It's like enjoying art, right? Um, in the case of sports, we can thank God for his gifting of the individuals who play excellently while praising the ability and their hard work, the man side of it, if you will, or the woman side of it, and, and how remarkable it is that they're able to you know, it's one thing you've got to be gifted as an athlete, right? But you've also got to put the, put the work in. Like you look at, and I, I listen to sports radio. Some that there's an ESPN radio station up at Crossville, and I listen often, and they'll talk about every now and then they'll talk about in the draft guys who are the best athletes end up not making it for for whatever reason. Um, I can remember was it Lamont Jordan was that a running back <clears throat> back in the day? Or oh, I'm trying to think of his name. Me. But I remember reading that he had like a four three forty, and he could jump like. High. I can't remember, 50 inches or something. It was it was just unbelievable the athlete this guy was. And then he didn't pan out in the NFL. Um, but you also think about guys like Herschel Walker, who the best college football player of all time, even better than Peyton Manning, mm. Jeff Wright. Fight me. <laughs> <laughs> No, nah, I mean, it's hard to argue. Walker oh, was incredible. Unbelievable. And then he gets to, you know, he goes to, was it the Canadian Football League at first? And then um, kind of gets wore out and gets on a rough team where he's the only player. And he's getting hit left and right. And he ends up not panning out. Um, but it, but it's just I don't know if you want to say Herschel Walker didn't pan out. Well, in the NFL compared to, oh, I mean, yeah. he, he could. What he was in the, we would have said he was the greatest in it. We would have, you'd assume he was the greatest in NFL player ever. Uh, I mean, he would. Sure, he, he would have been set up for that. He would have been set up. He would have sure. been. Um, but. You and I, you think of guys that we've seen come through UT men's basketball, the athletes. Like I, I remember Marcus Hayslip from years ago, and I can't believe he didn't pan out in the in the NBA. I mean, I bet that he could touch the top of the backboard as sure. far as athletically. We want to acknowledge there's a whole host of oh, reasons, yeah. and we're certainly not saying that these people fail by some, uh, you know, failure to be what they need to be. Right. You're just saying that this is a world that is very physical. Yeah. But that physicality can't be the sole determiner of future right. success. Hard work. You've got to you got to put the hours in, and there's family issues that come up, and all these things that there's there's various reasons why fellas, um, men and women, don't don't make it at that next level. Or you would think about a guy like Prefontaine, who mm-hmm. every Christian probably is familiar with the Chariots of Fire mm-hmm. narrative, who could have competed and probably, we would think, was likely to, to win the gold medal. But because of a religious conviction, said, I'm just not going to do it. Yeah. So there's negatives and positives sure. here as well. Sure. Um, you know, sports are distinct from other pop culture phenomena because they largely lack story. Now, we hinted at that. Or it's a different form of story. You know, sports are mainly propositional, meaning there's often not a greater narrative that the sports are telling. Instead, they largely tell you which team or person was the best on a given day. You know, however, as with any fandom, you know, Jeff Jeff over here could spend hours telling you about UT football, its history. And we've got a friend named Terry Felton that... <laughs> talk forever about people I didn't know existed. Um, He's just got all that information in his head. Um, But with any fandom, there's underlying stories in history with each person and team, yet it's not usually what draws people in. I mean, everybody knows who Steph Curry is, right? Because he could step across half court and throw it up and it'd go in. Um, people know who LeBron James is for very similar reasons, right? And six foot eight, man child at 18. And he looks the same today as he did when he was 18, right? Mm-hmm. He's just a, a phenomena. And uh, everybody knows who Odell Beckham Jr. is, right? Because he can catch anything you throw his way. Uh, well, you know. Yeah, and you've already talked about Muhammad Ali, Babe Ruth. I mean, yeah. those are people that... Mike if, Tyson. Yeah, if you're if you're an American, mm-hmm. they're just part of your sense of the world. I'm assuming in Latino cultures, Ronaldo is someone like that. Yeah. You know, like these global soccer stars. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, there's a... I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but there's a, there's a cricketer in India that is the Michael Jordan of cricket. Really? Everyone there knows him, and he's the chief endorser or, you know, or at least in his heyday was sports just cr- sports gives a platform to mm-hmm. people because we we exalt it very readily. And it, like you said, it's a federal there's a federal headship reality that somehow, even though I've never met this person, even though, you know, I by cheering them on, there's a real sense where my identity is tied to how well that person performs. And something I've noticed in um you know, so I 
we don't want to get into a debate here, but um, you know, I grew up in in a house where it, it's an egalitarian household. You know, my I was raised Church of God of Prophecy, and so my sisters played sports left and right. My sister Amy, who's my middle sister, um, she fought karate, and she would go to these karate tournaments and fight boys. And uh, I, I don't agree with that, but um, she would fight boys and would come home with black eyes and trophies where she whipped these boys. Where she so so concerned. I can only hope that she practiced on you <laughs> she continuously. Didn't. She, she didn't. Uh, she could, though, uh, whip me. Um, but, you know, thinking about MMA, one of the biggest losses in MMA that I felt was Ronda Rousey. You know, Ronda Rousey was just, she just incredible. When when you see this, this girl who, even though I'm bigger than her, I am convinced that she could destroy me in a heartbeat. I would be willing to chip into a, go, <laughs> a GoFundMe to test that hypothesis. And then, um, so when she lost, it, it uh, I don't know, it, it, it's hard to explain, but if you've ever had one of your favorite fighters or your favorite um, wrestlers or your favorite NBA, NFL team, Teams. Um, on the flip side of that, whenever um, whenever the New York Giants beat the Patriots, Tom Brady, Randy Moss, Patriots, they, I mean, and the underdog story. And I love in MMA, I love Frankie Edgar when he destroyed BJ Penn. BJ Penn looked like he got weighed him twenty pounds, and Frankie just gets in there, and I mean, he he's incredible, incredible. Um, but, but we're I, saying that this is part of the fallenness of sports mm-hmm. that we're too quick to find our identity oh, in yeah. these competitors or teams and or whatever. We move from one to the other. Sure. Who, who's your Who's your favorite player this next week, or who's your we 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 struggle more with teams, right? We want to hold on to a team and continue, but. Fans Fantasy sports has kind of blew that narrative up a little bit, right? Because you're in fantasy sports, listener, if you don't know, you get points based on how well individual players perform. And that so you've assembled on your team. Right. You pick players and you your team perform, you know, wins or loses based on how well those players play. Right. And these these players on your team won't necessarily be on the same team in the NFL. Right. And so what it does is is it gets you cheering for players, not teams. And so it kind of is kind Kind of blown up. It's not just football. It's basketball. It's um, baseball, golf, even NASCAR. You know, the, it, it gets you kind of cheering for different individuals instead of, instead of the team, right? The team aspect of it. So that is being blown up a little bit in sports. Or, right or with NASCAR, even I think more ridiculously manufacturers. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up as a guy who was like, as a kid, deeply committed to the superiority of Chevy over Ford. Mm -hmm. That was a very real point of passion for me. Oh yeah, me too. And I don't want to beat up on my friends who are huge NASCAR fans, but that community's kind of given to that anyway. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And if not that, then you're going to be talking about Roush or Hendrix or something, you know, like these people who you're even further removed from, you're not even laying eyes on them. It's just a badge or an icon. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, right. And so we often, I don't know, there's something about what do you think about this, Jeff? What do you, as far as sports lending itself to man's desire and woman's desire to, we need a tell loss. And if we don't have the ultimate tell loss, we, we settle for temporary. Like you think of Philadelphia fans, Cubby fans, right? Philadelphia finally, finally got a Super Bowl. You know that there are grandparents who and who have went to every game, right? Who have mm-hmm. went for years and years and years saying this day would come, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, the Cubs were that. Oh, yeah. Boston also oh, for yeah. years before yeah. that. The Red Sox. I, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. It gives us communal significance on things that seem to matter. And you're right. That sounds like a telos. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing that I think sports does is give you something measurable mm-hmm. that you can use to kind of pat yourself on the back, feel good about, and wield against someone who's an enemy. Mm-hmm. So, the, so much of my life is indeterminate in terms of knowing if I've succeeded or not. One of the things I give myself most to in terms of my mental energy, my prayer life, and my physical energy is preparing my children to be adults. I have no idea how that's going. There's no objective measurement of that. Yeah. I have glimpses of it, yeah. but I have no idea. Mm-hmm. And even what I think by the time I die, if, if the natural order plays out the way it is that I die sometime in their early adulthood, my sense of death won't even be objective. Mm-hmm. Sports gives you an alternative to that. Yeah. Scoreboard, okay, good mm-hmm. was done here or evil was done, and it's mm-hmm. concrete. Yeah, it is concrete. That's a good point. There is a moral order to sports. The rules are expected to be followed. Yeah. And uh, the team 
who can figure out the best way to, you know, theoretically follow the rules um, is the best. Yeah. yeah. And there's a there's a winner and there's a loser and it changes and it's it's often exciting. Um, you know, that's why mixed martial arts is growing like crazy is because of the um, the excitement that comes with and the strategy and the ability that is on display from one and the obvious to the physicality next. you see mm-hmm. the body working and you know you can tell if they've sculpted themselves or if they've not mm-hmm. like there's a lot of data available to you very immediately with mixed martial arts and, and there's always potential too for an underdog to win yeah there's always potential for I mean and not not to mention we love we love long streaks of winning because every time they fight is this the time that they're you know, you think of Anderson Silva, and you think of George St. Pierre, and um, well, again, the Patriots, yeah, the, the Bulls with the yeah. seventy-two win season, the Warriors a couple of years ago, yeah, yeah, we we do, but it also we just as immediately love the person who breaks the streak. That's right, that's yeah. exactly right, and we love them for a little while, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, kind of like one hit wonder type thing. But but I mean, some of these folks are, you know, they're they're it's amazing to to watch. Um, but March Madness in particular, as far as what's good about March Madness, it provides us with an opportunity to celebrate the universal value of humanity. You know, the good gifts given by God to his image bearers. In physicality, for instance, we see how good God is as a creator in Mm -hmm. giving a body that can do these wondrous things. Mm -hmm. You know, sports, basketball, I think very uniquely, maybe soccer be the only other thing I compare it to, is a unique combination of physical ability, Mm -hmm. skill one over practice through hard work and mental acuity. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're watching basketball, you're seeing the human on display mm-hmm. at very high levels of performance. I and think soccer is similar. And you've got, yeah, and you've got to depend on your teammates mm-hmm. in a way. I mean, you there's community. There's community. You've got to, you've got to depend on your coach. And often mm-hmm. the coach can make or break you. I mean, sure. we, we saw that in you know, we're particular um, to high school, but what made, so our, when our junior and senior year, our high school won the state tournament. Um, and, and they also went out and I even traveled down and you went too, cause you were, you were the manager. Um, went down to Arkansas and they beat, they won that tournament beating, uh, Joe Johnson was there on a team, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, who later played many years in the NBA. He's still, still in there. He's still yeah. in there. Mm-hmm. He's still, I mean, he's still what, 20 and 10 or 15, 10. Yeah. I mean, he's brought in still to this day as like a scoring specialist. Yeah. And at one point people kind of saw him as part of the rat pack with LeBron and Dwayne Wade, you yeah. know, that he was almost in their tier, yeah. you know? So yeah, yeah there's some important things that were accomplished. I tend to think maybe more than the coach, it, the success, was dependent upon the statisticians. On the but, manager. You know, I mean, each one has his own theory. I don't know if one's more credible than the other. But, I mean, watching watching my buddies play and, and win like that, and, I mean, they did have Mr. Basketball, right, as the point guard, and he's a phenomenal player, and they did have an amazing – I mean, Kyle Gribble's a gamer. Um, and so they had amazing players, but but uh, Coach Wyatt Oh, I mean, Jared, Brad. Yeah. We had – I mean, listeners, you're not going to know any of them. Yeah. But these were uniquely talented and hardworking people who, Absolutely. who really earned a lot of success. But you're right. The coaching was probably the strongest strength on the team. Yeah. And it made a huge difference. Yeah. That did. compensated from, for some weaknesses. Well, I mean, in part of, you know, they beat and you never forget it when they played uh, Pearl Cone in the state oh tournament. Gosh. And this team looked like NBA players mm-hmm. as far as athleticism. They were incredible. They tried to dunk on us left and right. And were often successful. They were, yeah. And uh, the thing was, though, Coach White had outcoached them. I mean, that's what sure. that's what it boiled down. I mean, our players played hard and rose to the occasion, but I think we're probably getting a little too much into are. insider baseball here. Yeah, yeah. But yes, what was happening is that, and this speaks to your point about the value of coaching and how that's compelling to us. Oh yeah. Coach White had outcoached them three years ahead. You know where what he was doing to build these guys as they became as they were freshmen to become juniors and seniors. Yeah. But then also in the moment, the strategy almost the way we tend to think of war, the strategy of the moment was also better. So well, on Pearl Cone, their center was John Henderson, big John Henderson, who played at UT football and went on to play for Jacksonville, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, had a very successful NFL career. Oh, yeah. He was in, he was incredible. But, and, and suddenly grew a mid-range game yeah, he, for, the, he, for the time he played White County. I he don't know. stayed outside shooting. Yeah, I remember him like backpedaling after hitting like the sixth you know, free throw line <laughs> jumper of the game. He'd never hit one before in his life. Oh, man. Anyway, so, so March Madness provides us an opportunity to come together. You know, you think of the racial tensions, for example, that are 
um, that have been going on our, on our country for a long time. Sports has actually been a unifying factor um, since back in the days of um, integration. Yes. And so on that level, absolutely. But also you just hear people talk about how in living through the, the cultural revolutions, that's true within families. So like Vietnam era, you'll hear these men say, me and my dad didn't agree about basically anything, but we had baseball. Yeah. We couldn't talk about politics. We couldn't talk about any other important issue, but we could talk about baseball. And it basically maintained the relationship yep. until cooler he- heads prevailed. Like me and my dad, some of the best memories I have are watching the Cowboys, Dallas Cowboys football. And, um, you know, we, I want that for my kids as well. That probably sound that may sound strange to a listener, but um, sports can bring you together as a family. And, and not, not just that, but like, it, like in my church, if I say anything about UT football, people, because we've got several who have season tickets and uh, they, you know, they love it. They, they love, there's Amen. a, there's a, right. I mean, there, there's, and we've got a few of those strange Vanderbilt fans, but. Um, Discipline. Yeah. Yeah. But there, there is goodness in March madness and one thing that is awesome about march madness is um you you see guys come along who in both the men and women who you, they come from nowhere appears like you you've never heard of them you don't know who they are you never heard of their team you didn't know the school existed but all of a sudden here they come and they're they're beating everybody they're upsetting people and you gotta love march madness for that i, I think that's why it's so popular is um because upsets. of the upsets yeah that come and you, you know you're wanting duke to lose aren't you Ted? absolutely if 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 the next time Duke assembles to play a basketball game, the stadium just fell in on those people. That. I would I would be mournful, but not as mournful as I should be. Oh my god. I goodness. would be like ninety nine percent as mournful as I should be. <laughs> And that's I'm joking a little. That's what's wrong with uh, sports and uh, me. <laughs> but uh, you know, there there is a <laughs> oh mate. So anything else you want to add? What do you like about? Tell us what you like about March Madness. Uh, March Madness to me is one of those uniquely spontaneous cultural moments that are so rare for us. It's almost a organic national holiday. Mm-hmm. Nobody I know, except for government employees and school teachers, which are also government employees. I guess <laughs> not my wife; she teaches at a private school. But uh, they they get off work, say for President's Day. There's, there's nothing celebratory about celebrating president presidents, though. It's just a day off from work. Yeah, that's hard in contrast to March Madness, where it becomes a, a cultural phenomenon that does some of the stuff you're talking about, unifying the culture. You're going to talk about that with people in your office. You're going to mm-hmm. talk about that with people across generational lines. Yep. This is as close to a civic holiday as we have in an authentic sense, where it's not something that's sort of arbitrarily encoded in our calendar. Mm-hmm. But that actual interest in the thing drives a diverse group of people to celebrate it together mm-hmm. and to give it significance uh, spontaneously. So people rarely want to sit and watch games by themselves or actually go to a game by themselves. But if they do, it's because they feel a familial relationship with who they're watching. Yeah. Right? Again, some of that federal headship stuff. Also, shades of the church. Yeah. That I am part of this community and that there's a redemption available by being part of this community. Yeah. So I mean, we've we've hit on some fallenness already. It, it produces idols. Um, it you know it tempts us to find our identity in things that are ultimately meaningless, mm-hmm. and prevents us from finding them in things that are more meaningful. What would you say is the narrative of, redemp- of redemption in March Madness? Well, it, in sports in general, let's point out before we do that. Let's talk about like the fella, you know, Michael Jordan. Let's talk about him just briefly. Okay. How we love Michael Jordan. How he is the greatest. Objectively, that's objectively true. the greatest basketball player of all time, mm-hmm. but it appears that he failed as in almost every other area. As far as mo- you think of morally, as a at least as a husband, faithful husband, faithful husband, right. um, he has actually. And, and I mean, we don't know, right? right. He, he could have had an unfaithful wife, I, right? But the the narrative that I'm aware of is that she basically grew tired of Michael's not being at home. What what happened beyond that? I don't know, yep. but yeah. But I mean, there there was actually. Actually, an article. It's been a few years back about who was the fellow that played on Chicago after him. Point guard. Do you love him, Pete Myers? No, not Pete Myers. Um, he he plays for Cleveland now, but just got hurt, I think. Oh, Derrick Rose. Derrick Rose. And uh, it was an article that that was written about Derrick Rose, and Derrick Rose was basically saying that he didn't want to be like Jordan because of he didn't want to lose 
family. Do you want know what article I'm talking about? Well, that's a continuing narrative with Derek. Now, Derek has been subject to a lot of injury, but Derek, one of the things I love about him is that he seems blissfully naive to the expectations of professional culture, mm-hmm. and it's been to his great detriment. But he will say, you know, my family is more important than basketball. Mm-hmm. That's heresy yeah. in modern sports culture. Yeah. And he, the narrative that comes out of that is that this is a guy who doesn't care enough and doesn't work hard enough. It's complete nonsense. Mm-hmm. He fought his way out of a Chicago neighborhood that's, from what my report, you know, what reporting I've read, mm-hmm. is incredibly hostile to human flourishing. Yeah, he he fought back from two major knee injuries, yep. and then had a third. It's clear this guy is very tough, very dedicated, but that he will make choices in a lot of his future health or make a contrast between the importance of sports and his family in a way that puts his family in the uh, priority. Mm-hmm. All the narrative that comes out, well, there's a, there's a very virulent stream of fans who say he just doesn't want it enough. He doesn't care enough. Mm-hmm. And as a fan of his, it makes me furious. Mm-hmm. But it so, speaks to brokenness in our culture. So basically to be successful, you got to give up everything else in life kind of is the danger. You know, Jordan Jordan needs to be praised for he, for what he did, his ability, his for being the greatest of all time. But we also need to be aware of the mistakes that are often inherent in becoming the greatest. Like I saw a, a fellow the other day. Um, I can't say his name, but he he's a uh, he, he's, he's a professor at Denver Seminary, and he wrote probably one of the best books on apologetics. Um, Douglas Grutius, I think is how you say his name. You know what I'm talking about? He posted on Facebook the other day. His wife is in poor health. And he said, you know, he, he just a sobering thought, you know, something along the lines, if I if I had never finished my book, you know, um, if I could have my wife back, like, like it was something very convicting. You know, I'm, I'm working on a doctorate. You've, you, you know, ministry and your master's and, you know, you can, you can try to build the best church. You know what I'm saying? Try to spend so much time. I'm building the successful church or I'm, you know, I'm, I've got to do this and you some got, vocational goal. Yeah. And you, and you can lose your, lose what really matters. And, and so what I want to say about about the gospel and how Christians should respond to sports is that, you know, God has called us not to be winners necessarily, but to be Christians. And so what this means is, is that the only ultimate battle that matters Jesus has already won for us. And so that frees you to win for the glory of God and to lose for the glory of God. You know, something, a fact about uh, March Madness is that there's going to be one winner and 63 losers. So every year, one winner, 63 losers. And and it, it's amazing. If, if, you're, if winning is everything to you, you're going to eventually be miserable because even Michael Jordan today has been a horrible GM. <laughs> well, he's an owner. He, oh, he's he, an owner? He owns the Bobcats, but of course he runs it. I've got much more to say on that. Let me... Yeah. Let let me let me say that for where I am, sure, because I want to talk about that. Um, in the redemption idea, yeah. I mean, you know, we'll at the end of March Madness, we'll get that montage that's famous, one shining moment, right? Yeah. So, would you agree with me that basically redemption in this sporting world is overcoming either the odds or your opponents or both to achieve through perseverance, skill, and uh, determination the crown of the victor? Yes, in March Madness, yes, or to set some record or to yeah. a new record, or I think there's a third level that is short term not as impressive but long term maybe more valuable mm-hmm. uh, is that you become the player that everyone pays attention to mm-hmm. you know you improve your draft stock or you give yourself a future if you're not an NBA level athlete you'll give yourself a future as like a, a speaker or a hero at your alma mater you'll never buy your own lunch ever again in your hometown yeah. you, you know what I mean like those things are available through sports and they kind of provide a, a kind of redemption they also bleed over into glorification mm-hmm. sports tells you that success is the ultimate glory. There is a lesser glory in having competed well mm-hmm. that I think is, we shouldn't despise that. Right. You know, to compete honorably, to give your all, even in a losing effort, we still at least give lip service to saying that's commendable. Yeah. Well, so we get to turn out questions. Um, the first one we ask is, what is the story? And you rightly pointed out that sports don't have a narrative inherently. Mm-hmm. But it is interesting to me um, that we do everything we can to make sure there is a narrative in March Madness and in great sporting events. We have archetypes set up for this. David and Goliath, the team that did not have the resources of the other team that manages to beat them nonetheless. So the story of Hoosiers, yeah. uh, the upsets in March Madness, we want to give them a narrative. Mm-hmm. The the narrative of the golden child who has you know been born into all this athletic giftedness, 
has and been trained from a young age to be uh, the the greatest whatever, the greatest quarterback, point guard, whatever. Mm-hmm. That's a that's an archetype that we try to and we often do shoehorn sporting events into a narrative. In some ways, it's crushing to the people who that gets assigned to. Mm-hmm. So you were talking about the narrative that Muhammad Ali created mm-hmm. for um, Joe Frazier. Mm-hmm. It, that narrative crushed Joe Frazier. It was a spiritual detriment to Joe Frazier. Now we could say Joe could have responded differently, but we're very sympathetic. Like he, he was converted later on. He he was put in a bad spot by Muhammad Ali. Mm-hmm. Um, you just think about these people. Like Harold Miner was a guy who came into the NBA. Who people said this is the next Michael Jordan. Yeah, and he couldn't quite live up to that. He was among the most successful people. A very small number of the most successful people at his given vocation, but he didn't live up to the narrative. Mm-hmm. And so people look at him as if he somehow failed. Um, these narratives are things that we're very interested in. I think it speaks to just how religious their participation in sports is mm-hmm. because we want them in a creation, fall, redemption, glorification narrative. Mm. And we'll draw on the Bible to find that narrative, you know, again, with the David and Goliath yeah. motif. Good call. Um, where do you find yourself in the story on this one? I'm, I'm a manager on the side. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the stands cheering them on. I no, honestly, um, whenever <laughs> whenever I watch basketball still today, I think in my head that um I can still go out and play some. Like do you, you could play some. <laughs> I mean, do you ever do you know what I'm saying? Do you ever have it in your head like like, like I can I can go I could go run that or I could go do that or I don't know. It's like it's like twenty years ago looking back and thinking I don't I don't know how to describe it, but or there or thought like when you're when I watch sports it makes me want to go play sports, if that makes sense. Even though I am <laughs> my bones creak and I'm thirty seven, you know, but um I can't really play sports, but I think I can. You know what I'm talking about? Well, my version of that, when I watch March Madness this year, I attain nothing great in terms of basketball, but I spend a lot of time with basketball camps, uh, games as a spectator. I will feel a mournful loss of the ability to compete as a basketball player. Mm -hmm. You know, these young guys that come through my life by virtue of me being their pastor, when I'm discipling them, I want to honor, you know, the ones that are athletes. I want to say that's an important part of who you are. Mm -hmm. Let's handle that well. One of the things I want to tell them is I didn't realize when I played my last competitive basketball game that actually meant something. You know, I played many more basketball games after the one I'm thinking of in gyms with friends and, you know Mm -hmm. what I mean, that were competitive, but there was no... Uh, significance beyond who just won in the moment. I regret that I didn't go into that last meaningful game with a greater sense of an important part of my life is passing away, mm-hmm. maybe until eternity. Yeah. Uh, so I will definitely feel that watching March Madness. Yeah, that's a good call. Like those days are over. Like it's sad. Like we, we've got a men's basketball league at my church that's starting Monday night. And when I watch those guys play, I'm thinking in my head, you know, my, my years of doing this are, are done, yeah. you know. Well, I mean, I could get out there. I could try to get in shape and go out there and do that. But, you know, it, it, it's not worth worth it today to me to mess up an ankle or mess up. You know, that's what's in my and head. there's a hard ceiling of how good you could be. There was a yeah. time in my life where I still had potential mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm past that. <laughs> You're you know? past your potential, huh? Yeah, as a in basketball sports. player. Yeah. <laughs> I probably had an elevated view of my potential anyway. Yeah, me But too. nonetheless, there were signs of growth. And sure. so I could kind of trick myself into saying I may get better. Yeah, that that's just over, yeah. and it's not just a, a insignificant athlete like whatever I used to be that feels this. I've heard Dirk Nowitzki, oh, who yeah. is an incredible basketball player, who's getting you know he's looking at forty in the face. Mm-hmm. Now Dirk could play in today's NBA till he's about sixty. Yeah, as a specialist, you know, just basically run from the three point line to the three point line and shoot three pointers. Yeah, there's a role for that in the NBA. And he, he's aware of that. But he also says at some point it just doesn't – it's no longer worth it to get ready to do that. Mm-hmm. The stretching and the training and the ice and the heat. And, and he's probably looking at a hard life after the NBA because how tall he is and how much yes. strain his body is had. Joints and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, there's – one of the things that I'm in is the person who kind of like that Bruce Springsteen song, glory days, they'll pass you by. You know, there's a lot of wickedness bound up in my athletic life. There 
there's a lot of good, mm-hmm. and I do miss it. And it's part of why I hope that there will be legit competition in heaven, because I sense, I think, in sports, this thing that will outlast us. We tend to think of sports as useful for preparing for something greater. Mm-hmm. So war was one of the traditional things that sports was supposed to prepare you for. Okay. Now we say sports should prepare you for life in the real world, where sometimes you can give your best and you don't succeed. Yeah. Or you give your best and you get the reward of succeeding, right? Yeah. But in some ways, I almost think that's reversed. I think in some ways, sports hints at the thing we will be doing in eternity that's like warfare, but that won't be warfare. We will have competition. There will be success and loss. There will be celebration for success and there will be, uh, you know, a regret over losing. Mm -hmm. But it will be in the most healthy way possible. And it will be done for the glory of God. Right. And, it, and it could happen with artistic accomplishments. It could happen with yes. other things as well. But I do think maybe a pickup basketball game in heaven will have the sort of cosmic consequences that we do legitimately sense just a little bit of through something like March Madness, mm-hmm. because it will be done purely to the glory of Christ, who was our creator mm-hmm. and who saw us into this place where the competition takes place. Uh, I'll tell you another one. This is a more bitter sense of where I am in the story. Back to Michael Jordan. Jordan made headlines as a 49 or 48-year-old when he went into the Hall of Fame. I don't know if you remember this. I saw it, yeah. But basically, Michael got up there and recounted everyone that had ever slighted him Mm -hmm. and, and sort of said, Revenge. Yeah, look where I'm at. And people were aghast. Yep. He's still, he's literally the best player ever. And I say, I, I legitimately believe that's objective. Someone may come along. I thought LeBron may be a threat. LeBron's close. He's not. He's not better than Jordan. People were aghast that this guy who literally had it all was still stuck in this me against the world mentality. Mm-hmm. But it's our fault. Mm-hmm. We rewarded him for giving himself to nothing more than he gave himself to proving everyone who ever doubted him wrong. Everything he got came through, yes, his physicality, but maybe even more his ability to be motivated to overcome all odds and to find constant motivation to fight against something that would provoke him to the highest level of performance. It is our fault. Mm -hmm. The fan. What became of Michael Jordan? I am culpable for that. I may not be ultimately culpable. I don't know how those things shake out, Mm -hmm. but I'm culpable for that. And that we would have the hypocrisy to be shocked at this product of our own fascination Mm-hmm. Just being what we made him to be yeah. is really ugly and is and is at least as wicked as him being stuck in that place as a 50-year-old. It's like Terrell Owens not getting in the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's very similar, very similar. They keep snubbing him on the Hall of Fame in the NFL because of how he carried himself, me-centered, me-centered, me-centered. But it ingrains that in. That's why he was the one of the greatest. Well, and, and 100 people representing various different sports networks and, and news networks showed up at his house to watch him do sit-ups in his drive. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. This is on us. Yeah. I'll tell you, this really came home to me. Uh, You were talking about how we used to like to watch professional wrestling. Mm -hmm. And I'm a sucker for a good documentary. So not too long ago, ESPN, I think, released a documentary on Ric Flair. Yeah. Ric Flair was never my favorite wrestler. Me either. But he was always one of the wrestlers that I was watching. Mm -hmm. And what became clear over that documentary is playing this professional wrestler character, Rick tried everything he could as a real life human being to become that character. Yep. And so his character was living a flamboyant lifestyle, you know, supposed to be the envy of everyone because he had every carnal pleasure available to him. He had money, he had beautiful women, he had food and drink. Yeah. Rick tried to live that and was largely successful. He ruined multiple marriages. Mm-hmm. And while he apparently has a good relationship with his kids now, his children suffered deeply mm-hmm. because dad was gone being Rick Flair. Yeah. And there's even a narrative online, I can't adjudicate this, but there's a narrative online that his son who is dead is dead because because he tried to hang with his father. Mm-hmm. He wanted to party like his dad. He wanted to have a lifestyle like his dad lived. But he, he did harder stuff than his daddy did. His daddy was an alcoholic, but he got into harder drugs. And actually, his I reckon he, he was wrestling in Japan. Rick had him. Rick was there with him and actually found him. He had OD'd. Yeah. He's so like 20 years old. Right. And so constitutionally, mm-hmm. this is a factor in his death. Yeah. Well, I think the easy thing to do is say, Rick Flair is a piece of garbage. I think what needs to be said is, why? 
why did you reward him with your attention yeah. and feed this kind of nonsense? Mm-hmm. Who are we to reinforce these kind of decisions? Even if the person who's mm-hmm. being glorified is on board with it, even if the people who are wounded by him being glorified. So if you went and talked to his daughter, Charlotte, who's now a professional wrestler herself and made you know quite a name for herself as a mm-hmm. performer, if you go to her and say, would you take it back? And she said, no, no, I'm glad my dad was who he was. I wouldn't trade. She's still wrong. Yeah. And I'm culpable for feeding that beast. Yeah, that's a good point. And I have to take a long, hard look at myself and say, one, I'm going to stop doing this. But then number two, how do I help people younger than me not make the same mistake? Mm -hmm. So when I see myself in the story, I see myself as basically the person in the Roman Colosseum Mm -hmm. begging the emperor to go ahead and have the competitor executed. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. It really brings a responsibility to where it needs to be, right? Into into our our own hearts and minds. Um, Just because Ric Flair will never meet me, yeah, doesn't mean I, that I don't have a hand in what destroyed his family. Well, and at the end of that documentary, was so sad is they ask him what he wants to be remembered for, and he says, "Well, I wasn't a good husband. I wasn't a good father. I was a good wrestler. I guess I want to be remembered for that." And that my heart just broke. That is such a it's such a dark mid. Like he had what's crazy, man, is he. Had head Basically, like you said, everything any carnal man could want, or even in even you know uh, any sinful man could want, uh, and yet, and by sinful man, you mean me, me like and you, yeah. We would like yeah. to have the financial stability that yeah. his success afforded him, for in instance. Our car, in our carnal carnality, our younger days, the yeah, 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 women and uh, other things yeah. that would be even yeah. less, yeah. Oh yeah, and um, he had all that, and yet the misery. He's going to die alone, almost. I mean, it, it's he, and and actually, since that documentary, he's almost he almost perished recently. Yeah. Um, it's just, but what if he doesn't die alone? It'll yeah. be purely because people were better to him than he was to them. Right. His children are more loving at yeah. this stage of life to him than, than he was to them when he was in their stage of life. Yeah. That's so sad. It's and such again, a bleak. Yeah. It's, it's devastating. Mm-hmm. And I really think you have to look in the mirror and go, you cheered for this guy. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. And I, I felt the same way with, um, I mean, with, you think of Hogan, you think of these, uh, you think of, um, I mean, the, these other stars that in the NBA and if so, and you would say that with Michael Jordan as well, and uh, Terrell Owens, and we we rewarded these guys for it. And right now, Conor McGregor, mm-hmm. right, um, he is being rewarded for it. the reason why he is insanely popular and a multimillionaire is because he is a pompous jerk, and he's good at punching people. He is in the good face. at punching people in the face, but he gets in their head lots of times before they get in the ring. You know, the one that stands out to me on this that I was aware of is Floyd Mayweather. Uh, now, yeah. I don't like Floyd's fighting style, yeah, but Floyd's probably the best fighter, at least of his generation. Yeah. My lifetime, maybe longer. Very skilled fighter, never takes a hit. Yeah. You know, can't hit him square. No, but Floyd likes to hit women. Yeah. And we have not removed his platform for that. Yeah. It's almost like Chris Brown, the the, the hip hop artist. Yep. We just, we just pretend like it doesn't, like we don't know this. Mm-hmm. It's unconscionable, mm-hmm. but we just keep right on. Now, I, I mean, I said, I'm not. Right. But I'm not saying that in a way that makes me superior. Uh, I just told you, Michael Jordan and Ric Flair, I had a hand in, it, it, even from a distance. The hypocrisy that sports pushes us to Mm -hmm. and the way it legitimizes things that are subhumanly awful Mm -hmm. is to our shame as a nation, as a people, as a culture. Mm -hmm. And there's there's just no way around it. So in a lot of ways, when we look for ourselves in the story here, we're in the story of the Judas. We're just, we're the ones betraying what is good and beautiful and true. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be too bleak, but those things are heavy on my mind. And because what we're about to do, you know, I think my read on the tournament this year is that this is not a year when there's clearly a best team. Mm -hmm. And in those situations, a team that gets hot or a team that can play good defense and have one guy who's a a, a great scorer, they tend to have success in years like this. Mm -hmm. If that plays out, we're going to create a kid who thinks that he's peaked in life because he scored a bunch of points over a what 10-day period in March when he was 19 years old. Mm -hmm. It's great that sports give so much, but we've got to be mindful of what it's taking as well. And I don't really have good solutions for this, Yeah, but it's it's about to happen with somebody well, or the, some group of somebody. The, the solution is, I think, and you know, I, I mean, I'm a I'm a Tim Tebow fan. I assume you are as well. He has a a good mentality, it seems, as far as sports. When he when he is he sees it as not ultimate, right? Um, anytime he's interviewed, he talks about you know, it seems that he often talks about how the ultimate goal is to glorify God through Christ. And and because well, again, Prefontaine would be someone in history that we would say yeah. had, a, had, a, had a sense of a higher calling that was helpful. Yeah, and it it really frees. 
frees you to enjoy the moment and enjoy the time period that you played sports and to enjoy. And you can actually go home and sleep at night, not rehearsing everything you did wrong or, you know, everything that you did right or, or even holding on to that nostalgia. And I don't think nostalgia is, is inherently for anything mm-hmm. like that. I think, I mean, uh, they're like watching football with my dad. My dad's with the Lord. And I still, when I watch the Cowboys play, I still kind of have that nostalgic thing that I want to pass on to mm-hmm. my, I don't think that that's inherently bad. I think it's good, but it's because it's not ultimate. You know, if you're always reaching back to the past, you can enjoy today and you can enjoy tomorrow. You know, I mean, you can't you can't look ahead. And so what the gospel provides us is the ultimate thing that I need in life. Christ has provided fully, perfectly, and it frees me. Yes. So I think what we're getting at here is something about how the gospel applies. So can we hold for just a second? What's good, true, and awesome in March Madness and sports in general? Um, I would say competition is good. I would say I would say winners and losers is a good thing. It it uh, there is a you're going to see fellas who um, men and women who it brings competition brings out the best often in individuals and it helps to hone. Um, it shows you your weaknesses. Um, it shows you um, so it, it reveals things you need to work on, which is a good thing. It also reveals uh, things that you're good at and maybe that, that you've attained. That you've attained. That hard work is paying off. Worthy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. It, shows, again, as we talked about, the excellence in coaching, the excellence on the floor, the athleticism. And then there's some people who are just good at, uh, it's weird, it's strange, man. Not always, It's not always the most athletic person who's the best player on the floor. Um, no, I get what you're saying. They're, just, they're sort of good at basketball, even if you can't document it in statistics or, yeah. yeah. I mean, even in, like, I, I live in Crossville, Tennessee, and a few years ago, there was a fella whose last name was Cole, who uh, was like a 6'1 point, or a 6'1 center over here at Stone Memorial High School. And he ended up playing at Bryan College, but he would hang forty points on six foot eight guys down low just because he could he could maneuver his body. He's not the most athletic guy. I don't even think he could dunk it. It surprised me if he could touch rim. He may be able to, but you know he would just move in such a way that they could not keep him from the basket. And it's just interesting to see the skill that some folks have that is not it's not often. I mean, well, and it's part of their created beauty. Yeah, like yeah. so, he's not LeBron James, right? But the creator who's infinite in his creative abilities yeah. shaped him in a particular way that basketball reveals. That maybe is counterintuitive, yeah. but we're thankful that basketball kind of put in front of us. Oh, yeah, yeah. And and to see, I, I love seeing that building. And I love rooting. You love rooting for fo- for fellas who don't look like they should be out there, right? I mean, uh, I mean, I, I, some folks, they just, you're like, how do they score? You remember Jeff Hornacek in the NBA? Yeah, <laughs> well, like, <laughs> he was an example of someone who really gave himself to a skill. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I, I know what you're saying. So You're like, how does he score out there with those right. guys? But he, I mean, he just had a way, mm-hmm. and I, I feel that way kind of with Ginobili a little bit. And, I mean, Ginobili? Are you talking about Manu he, Ginobili? Ginobili, sorry. Charles Barkley would have your head for that. <laughs> Anyway, no, yeah, yeah. Barkley's another. I mean, Barkley yeah. was another one who no, was phenomenal. But Manu like, is very athletic. Yeah, but not in the way LeBron is. Right, it's more of a body control thing. Yes, but yeah. now Charles Barkley is another six one guy. Yeah, who could jump over. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, well, you know, everybody talks about these unicorns, Chris Stapps Porzingis, or Giannis Antetokounmpo in the in yeah. NBA right now. There's never going to be another Charles Barkley. Yeah, there, you know, I love UT's basketball program. There's a there's a guy on the team that people are calling Baby Barkley. He's short. He plays a power position on the uh, floor. He's athletic. He's nothing like Charles Barkley. <laughs> Charles Barkley could be as likely an alien as <laughs> yeah. a human being because of how unique he is. I so, bet he could dunk it today. I bet. Barkley. Oh, sure. I mean, sure. even if he's 280, 300 pounds, whatever he weighs now. Well, I mean, yeah, a couple of years ago, Dr. J had a documentary released about him, ended by him as a 70 year old dunking a basketball. Oh, my goodness. I, I'm pretty sure he was 70 by that point. That is unbelievable. In, you know, it, again, we tend to assign the. The wonder of that to the person, but the wonder of it's to the creator. That's right. That's to, right. You know, we, we live in a world that's fallen and death is coming for us all. Mm-hmm. But he shows you what it might look like to live eternally youthful mm-hmm. in certain individuals who just like got Her- more. Herschel Walker. Herschel Walker. Hey, sure. listener, go look up Herschel Walker today after 50. <laughs> Tell me an athletic competition that he could jump into that you wouldn't think he would be moderately successful he, at. He runs a four four forty, I think, today. I mean, just faster than most people in the NFL. Faster than most running backs in the NFL. I mean, 
just incredible. What's distorted, evil, and false? I think we've I think we've hit on a lot of that. Um, the idol worship, the like you were talking about, um, playing into treating this person like a god for what they can do, or idolizing them, and then when they turn out to be an idolater, worshiping of self, we're surprised, yep. we're shocked, we're oh you can't do that when we've basically we gave them the platform to hang themselves. Is basically we told what you're them saying. they should find their meaning in this thing. Yeah, absolutely right. Yeah, um, I, I do think there's a way in which sports also gives us a false church Mm -hmm. that what we're supposed to find in the new humanity that Christ is creating through Mm -hmm. his shed blood we find in the Green Bay Packers and you find I mean in every Saturday and Sunday and what you'll see at March Madness um, is and you see it in football you see it in basketball you see it in the Coliseums in soccer you see it in the Coliseums with NASCAR those places 150,000 people descend on a track to watch this on the Lord's Day you know it's amazing the community everybody longs for community they long for something to join around and it's amazing some great event that they some, celebrate repeatedly you know, not not the resurrection of Christ not the dead man rising and conquering death saving his people and taking a kingdom for himself and bringing yeah. all things into conformity with himself the evil one but we you almost sound like a fundamentalist when you say we should probably do that instead of run out of church to go to the NFL game yeah. you, you know what I mean like yeah. you almost sound crazy but we're talking about the creator and sustainer of the world who entered death on our behalf and rose triumphantly from yeah. it and reigns over all molecules. Yeah. And we're like, it's cool if we have an early service so we can get to watch the NASCAR. Yeah, I want to see somebody catch Race. a pass and yeah. score a touchdown and dance. Yeah. Um, yeah, don't be a fuddy-duddy by saying that maybe our, our priorities are out of whack. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think we should own that many priorities are out of whack. They are out of whack. They are definitely out of whack. And just turn on your TV and see how many people are there and how many – and, you know <sighs> – I mean, we, we want to celebrate sports. We also want to want to point out the reality that the religion of America and really the world. I mean, if there's a dominant religion in the world, at least the etern- the external trappings you would associate yeah. with religion, like well, it, going to a sacred place yeah. and participating in sacred rituals. Yeah. You're right. It's sports. It, it's sports. It, I yeah. mean, it would be soccer or football or yeah. basketball. Yeah. Um, I mean, it would be one of those or, or martial arts in, in other other countries. You think of Brazil. And and um, you think of in the uh, east, right? Um, but you know, all, all that said, those are the the trappings and the dangers. You got anything to add that we haven't already covered? No, I just want to blend. How do we subvert idolatry, and how does the gospel apply? Yeah. And the way that I think we subvert idolatry is by applying the gospel as a meta narrative. Yeah. We hinted at a lot of this earlier. Yeah. It's the same thing I said about politics. We're an increasingly secular age, but we're not increasingly secular people because we're made to respond to our creator. Mm-hmm. So we have to push something up into the religious significance category that's ultimate. Mm-hmm. Well, a lot of that's sports. Yeah. So I'm with you. Now, I can't stand the University of Football, Florida. Yeah. Excuse me, the University of Florida football program. What about Spurrier, are you like him? Uh, no. <laughs> Urban Meyer, either. <laughs> but I can't help but respect Tim Tebow. Yeah. Now, Tim Tebow is of my tribe, mm-hmm. theologically, at least broadly speaking. But the thing I think is that is helpful to Tebow as a person, and that he models well and may have contributed to a lot of the rejection that happened to Tebow as a professional athlete, is that he has an ultimate narrative that keeps sports from climbing into the category of the ultimate for him. Mm-hmm. And he sort of indicts all the rest of us by saying, guys, that's not ultimate. Yep. I've been to the very heights of that. And I can tell you there's something that's infinitely more important than that. He, I think part of the reason people love to hate him is because it's kind of a mirror held back up to our face and going, well, how dare, how dare you tell me this thing that I have given myself wholly to is not worth that. Yeah. But that's what's needed. That's what the athlete who's going to win the uh, most outstanding player of March Madness or his team or that coach or the person who's left in defeat and had his dreams frustrated needs. They need the gospel narrative mm-hmm. to say what's ultimately important is the story God's telling about Jesus through the cosmos. And this is one of the supporting chapters of that story. Mm-hmm. And because things are well with Jesus, things ultimately are going to be well for me. That's the that's applying the gospel to subvert the idolatry. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, I agree with all that. Um, I would say that um, also that people who are seeking sports and loving teams and, and diehard fans, what they ultimately long for is the, the meta narrative of the gospel, right? And the federal head, Jesus Christ. Yes, yes. That was the last thing I want to say. So take it and run yes, with that. They, they long for, um, well, they long for someone to win eternally. I mean, they, Someone greater than themselves yes. who is successful in the most important contest yes. and whose actions actually shape their own identity. Yes, yes. They, they long for all those things, but they, they find it in 
sports and it does not satisfy. Mm-hmm. And it and you can tell that it doesn't satisfy because once they win the Super Bowl, go find an Eagles fan right now. What are they talking about? Are they talking about the Super Bowl? They're talking about next season. Well, even if they are, there's they're a zealot yeah. that, that will eventually exhaust itself. Oh, yeah. And if it doesn't, we would all sort of gather around and go, that's a tragic thing. Yeah. That that was the pinnacle of that person's life. Oh, yeah. And they're, but they're, they're always longing for what's next. And something amazing about Christianity is, yes, we do long for what's next. We long for eternity. But we're also looking back to 2,000 years ago to an event that changed everything. Amen. Right? And uh, there, there's great freedom in that looking back and looking forward because both of them, right, are objective realities that are not changed based on how well the evil one prepares his armies to fight against Christ, right? And uh, the thing about um, putting all your eggs in the team's basket is your team will lose. The basket has a hole in it. It does. And there's nothing you can keep plugging it and keep plugging it. I mean, I, I'm a, just going to punch me, but a Kentucky basketball fan. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I, I just threw up a little bit right here. I'm going to clean that up while you finish this up. <laughs> but they are, they are struggling. They are struggling a little Hallelujah. bit. But they're tournament people. So, you know, yeah. they're, they're going to come in March Madness and, and probably beat uh, UT if they play. Shut your mouth. <laughs> Uh, UT, I hope, goes far. That though. is depressingly accurate. <laughs> But, but, you know, in all, all seriousness, you know, um, winning isn't everything, and God's glory is. and Well, Christ winning everything is everything. Yes, but that's finished. Yes. It's and coming to fruition, right? Complete. Yeah. Um, now, it's, it is still to be celebrated. Right. But, yeah, it's finished, and it is the chief signifier of what is happening in the cosmos in history. You know, re- repentance and faith in Christ, His finished work means that we don't have to finish the work for Him. Um, so our salvation is secure forevermore, regardless whether we win or lose, or regardless whether our team wins or loses. And because Christ lost in our places, conquering death, rising from the dead victoriously, means that in Him we have won forevermore. And so when we win or lose a basketball game or football game, it doesn't change the fact that in Christ we've won. And so, you know, and and that's true whenever we are, not just sports, but whenever we can pay our bills and when we can't. It's true whenever we are healthy and whenever we're suffering with illness, disease, when when we're out of the nursing home and when we're in the nursing home, when we're out of the hospital, when we're in the hospital. You know, this is objectively true and unchanging. I mean, it, it, it's more certain that Christ is ruling and reigning than that the sun is going to rise tomorrow, right? Amen, brother. And I mean, that really frees you. So I'm not worried about whether or not the sun's going to rise. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping it rises tomorrow, right? It'd be quite terrifying if it did. Yeah, that's right. But, um, you know, Christ finishing his work for me and securing my inheritance forevermore means that I'm free here not to be a poor steward of what the Lord has given me, but I'm free to pursue excellence while failing because I'm basing not only my eternity, but my life today on what Christ has sealed in my state, right? Amen. I in think, other words, oh, wait, wait. one final thing, enjoying Christ frees you to truly enjoy sports. I mean, I would argue that Christians should enjoy sports in the best possible way, right? The way God intended them to be enjoyed. Amen, brother. Amen. I'm sorry I stepped on that there at the beginning. Um, in some ways, the only thing I, I want to say to finish up on sports in March Madness is that it's not unlike what we saw in Coco in our previous episode. Sports give you the illusion of having an immortality and a significance that outlasts you. And in doing that, it affords you this vision of like a good eternity that people always remember how significant I was because of that March Madness or because of Mm -hmm. that, you know, NBA championship or whatever, or those NBA championships. That's a false immortality. What you're looking for is in Jesus, who is the one who not only uh, says your life has significance in the way that it reflects his glory, but that your eternity will be shaped and will carry that meaning over in a lot of ways to be enjoyed forevermore in him. Mm -hmm. Don't let sports trick you into thinking you can get through them what you're actually wanting to find in Jesus because it's much better in him and like you said you'll enjoy sports much better once you have it rightly ordered amen amen all right brother so we went long on sports I'm just going to run through this real quick though since we're talking about it do you have a pick for the tournament I don't Kentucky yeah or UT okay so I I think you know this we've not hit on it here my basketball allegiance at the collegiate level is first to the University of North Carolina rather than UT I do root for UT mm-hmm. unless they're playing North Carolina, which they did, you know, this year. And they, um, yeah. So I'm going to make my picks 
when I fill out my bracket, I always go for good coach. And that's particularly true in, in a year like this where there's not some dominant team. Mm-hmm. So Villanova, North Carolina, Michigan State, University of Tennessee are the ones who will move far in my bracket. Mm-hmm. But this is just the sort of year where a team that has one really elite player mm-hmm. or gets hot at the right time can come in and take everything over. So Kentucky, Michigan, if Kevin Weldon's listening, I think Michigan's in a good place to maybe be that team. Mm-hmm. Even a team like Alabama, who is not on the radar, is kind of a bubble team anyway. Yeah, you might see that this year. So that that those are my NCAA tournament picks, uh, and I, I offer them not because I'm an expert, but so that we can talk about them in the future and see if I got close. Yeah, cool. All right, man. Hey, where can they find you outside of the Pop Culture Quorum Dale podcast, Jared? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Jared H Moore. You can find me on my website, JaredMoore.ExaltChrist.com. You can find me on Facebook at All Truth Is God's Truth, and I have another podcast called All Truth Is God's Truth. Look it up. Check it out. I'm at Right Jeff on most social media platforms. Uh, we, as a podcast, and both of us are active on social media through the podcast accounts, are at PCCD Pod on almost all social media platforms. You can also find us on Reddit. Our subreddit is PCCD Pod. We'd love to talk to you through any of those. If you guys are willing to leave us reviews on iTunes or wherever you're listening to podcasts, that would be so helpful for us, and we'd appreciate it. Uh, we would love five stars. We'll take whatever you want to give. That would be helpful. And if you listen to last episode, you will have heard this, but I want to just remind you one more time. If you're on Facebook, like our page, or if you've already done that, go to our page and over by where it says following at the top, click see first so that uh, our content makes its way through Facebook's algorithm to your eyes. That mm-hmm. That is a change that they instituted not too long ago, and we just want to do everything we can to, to help people connect with what we're offering because we legitimately do want to help people. And hearing from you helps us know if we're being helpful or how we could change to be more helpful. Mm-hmm. All right, guys. Well, thank you again for or pressing download on this episode and then hitting play. Uh, we hope that it's profitable to you. We'd love to hear your own thoughts about sports. So get at us through some of those means we just mentioned there. We will be watching the NCAA tournament along with you, and we will talk to you next time on the next episode of the Pop Culture Formdale Podcast. Mm-hmm.